I'll just say hello to everyone. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, lovely to see those of you who are on joining us online um, this evening. And we've got a couple of people here face to face, too, which is nice. Um, very much looking forward to this evening's talk. Um, Hassan, uh, a friend from um, Monash Interfaith Gathering with Peru also, his wife. Um, lovely to have you with us and uh, looking forward to what you have to say. I will just wave um, a few booklets and things that um, they've, they've lent, given us, to given, to, given to, to, so if anybody's interested in any information, there's a few copies of these available on the book table um, as we leave. Um, and over a cup of coffee as well. Um, so look, I'm not going to take any more time. No, so thank you very much for uh, for joining us, and I look forward to what you have to say. Thank, thank you. For you. Having thank you. Oh, do you want to see, do you want to stand here because then you can be seen nice and clear? Okay, well, I'll share your that's, that's your fine. document as well. For those thank you. Who need to. Am I there now? Yes, you're okay. there. Excellent. All right. Do I look good? Yes. You do. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You look impressive. Uh, huh? <laughs> well, thank you for having us. It's really an honor to be here. And thanks for the invitation. We hope to be able to reciprocate this so uh -huh. that you also come to our meeting and give your side of the story, basically. But, you know, we should have open mind about everything. Mm. Never close the door because okay. you don't know what's behind the door. It could be to your advantage. <laughs> Right. If it wasn't to your advantage, close it. But at least open it and see what it is. Yeah. All right. I think that's the, my philosophy in life. That we need, we need to we, we need to be able to look in every possible uh, the thing that comes across. Sometimes it's our benefit that mm -hmm. is coming across. Mm -hmm. And if you close it, then we have lost the opportunity. So again, thank you. Thanks for having us. The, the Baha'i faith and the Christianity go basically hand in hand. All right. The, it's nothing strange about that. Although Baha'i, the name Baha'i might be strange to you, right? Because it's something that you haven't heard. It's not a, it's not a very common word. But where it's originated is actually, it's a, it's an Arabic word that stands for glory. And Allah is God. So it's glory of God. When you say Baha'u'llah, which is the founder prophet of the Baha'i faith, you're saying glory of God in short. Right? And so Baha'i is, is, is faith. It's called Baha'i because it relates to Baha. But I, at the end of Baha'i, it relates back to back to Baha'i, so <clears throat> you belong to glory, right? If I'm a Baha'i, I'm a person who is following Baha'i. That's very simple. You're Christian because you're following Christ, right? The, so Baha'i, you're following Baha'i. So <clears throat> I want to read you the, a little bit of a story. And the story is basically the beginning of the Baha'i faith, right? <clears throat> and the story is this. <clears throat> A young man was being led captive through the crowded streets. His neck was encased in a huge iron collar. Long ropes were fastened to the collar by means of which he was pulled through the rows of, of people lining the streets. When he faltered in his steps, the guards savagely jerked him on his way or delivered a brutal well-aimed kick. Occasionally, someone would dare out of the crowd, break through the guards and strike the young man with a fist or a stick. Cheers of delight from the crowd accompanied each successful attack. When a stone or piece of refuse hurled from the mob struck the young captive in the face, the guards and the crowd would burst into laughter. 
rescue yourself, O oh great hero. One of the virtues is called Makuti. Break asunder your body. Produce for us a miracle. Then he is back at the silent figure. The young man was led at last to his place of execution. It was 12 o'clock noon in the barracks square of a sun, sun-baked city. The firing squad was assembled. The blazing summer sun flashed from the barrels of the raised muskets pointed at the young man's breast. The soldiers awaited their command to fire and to take his life. The crowd leaned forward expectantly, hoping to witness, even at, la- at this last moment, a miracle. Latecomers were still pouring into the public square. Thousands swarmed along adjoining the rooftops. Looking down upon the scene of, of death, all eager for one last look at this strange young man who, in six short years, had so troubled their country. He was either good or bad. They were not sure of this. Yet, he seemed so young to die, barely 30. Now that the end had come, this victim of their hatred and persecution did not seem dangerous at all. The crowd was disappointed. They had come hungering for drama, and he was failing them. The young man was a strange paradox, helpless yet confident. There was a look of contentment, even of eagerness, on his handsome face. As he gazed into the menacing barrel of the 750 cocked rifles, the guns were raised, the command was given fire. In turn, each of the three columns of 250 men opened fire upon the young men until the entire regiment had discharged its bodies of bullets. There were over 10,000 eyewitnesses to this spectacle that followed. Several historical accounts have been preserved. One of these states, the smoke of the firing of the 750 rifles was such as to turn the light of the noonday sun into darkness. As soon as the cloud of smoke had cleared the way, an astounded multitude looked upon a scene which their eyes could scarcely believe. The cords with which the young man had been suspended had been rent in pieces by the bullet, yet his body had miraculously escaped the bullet. M.C. Hart, a French author and a Christian, also wrote an account of this episode. The soldiers, in order to quiet the excitement of the crowd, showed the cords broken by the bullets, implying that no miracle had really taken place. MC Heard, in fairly describing this remarkable event, states, amazing to believe the bullets had not strongly condemned, but on the contrary, had broken the bonds and he was delivered. It was a real miracle. ALM Nicholas, the famous European scholar, also recalled this spectacle. An extraordinary thing had happened, he said. Unique in the annals of the history of humanity, the bullets cut the cords that held him, and he fell on his feet, on his feet without a scratch. This is not where the story ends. I promise to come back. But before that, I would like to make it clear, really, that you're here talking about the upcoming of the Lord of hosts. So it's not a small thing that I'm talking about. End of the 2000 year old waiting and expectation. And hence, heralding the arrival of mankind to its portal of maturity. It can only, I can 
only pray and hope that I can convince, convey the message to you in a meaningful way. That I've done the right thing by you and by you, my Baha'u'llah. After all, Christ himself asked everybody to get to the truth for yourself. It is important here and timely for me to say that I have based all this talk upon the book of Thief in the Night. <clears throat> a couple of copies of this here. The the writer of this is Mr. William Sears, and you can access it by going to the bahailibrary.com and actually down, download the whole book if you like. And otherwise, there are copies that you can have. <clears throat> In the Bible, there is no subject spoken of, I mean, the New Testament. Subject that is more frequently spoken than anything else in the New Testament is the return of Christ. It's possibly said over 250 occasions of the return of Christ in, in, the, in the New Testament. The disciples of Christ were actually very familiar with, with the promise of his return. And they would discuss this amongst themselves a lot. <clears throat> But they wanted a better understanding of what and how this will take place. So they went to him, they, asked him, they directly asked Christ, so how is your return? How your return look? And he gave them a very plain answer, very, very direct answer. He didn't you know, hide it in anything, wrapped it in anything. He gave them the answer. And he put three conditions on it. And these are the three <coughs> conditions that he put on his return. One is that the gospel, his gospel, will be preached right throughout the world. Secondly, is that the time of Gentiles is over, is finished. And third, that you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. In other words, so that the, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> basically renewal of religion. Religion is darkened, okay? And then he will come to rescue the, the, and bring a new faith to the people. So my suggestion to you is that this, the, both three promises were fulfilled by 1844. But you might say, okay, how? Right. <clears throat> so when you hear that, you might say, okay, um, where and when did this happen? How did the Christian world as a whole missed him. If it happened, how could they miss him? Have they made the same mistake all over again that our ancestors, our ancestors did 2,000 years ago? And have we followed the same path as those scholars, the Jewish scholars? And don't forget that they were scholars, and they missed him. And have we tried to read the books again that they were seen? And we don't understand it. Have we tried to misinterpret it again? So I'm going to get back to that. Bible tells us that the disciple of Christ were deeply troubled because the religious leaders, the businessmen, the influential people, the scholars, ordinary people, except a few, they did not accept it or understood his message. So they went to Christ for help. 
And this is the question that they put directly to Christ. Why do, why do the people not believe? They asked him. Surely the signs are plain. And Christ answered, because it is given unto you to know the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have been closed. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. You find that in Matthew. So Christ comforted them. He is explaining that it needs a special eye, it needs a special eyes to see and a special ears to listen. And he said to them that you are alive because you have believed. And the people who are not believing are dead, although they, they are physically living, but spiritually they are dead. So the old believers were mocking the, the new believers, basically. They would say, reason should tell you that this Jesus cannot be the Messiah. So they were looking everything from the reason point of view. If he was the Messiah, then, then Elias would have already come. Does not our holy writing say that Elias must come first? If this man of Nazareth is the Messiah, then where is Elias? Tell us. The disciples find this question too hard to answer because they didn't know the answer. So they went back to Christ and they asked, him. they put this directly to him. They asked him. Jesus told them that Elias had come. Elias had already appeared among the people, he said, but no one had recognized him, nor understood this truth. Elias, Christ told them, he had come in a manner which the people did not expect. And for this reason, they did not know him. Patiently, Christ explained this symbolic truth to the disciples. If he will receive it, John, John the Baptist, is Elias. This was an astonishing explanation. John the Baptist was Elias. Christ prefaced, prefaced his explanation with the words, if you will receive it. This return, which Christ is talking about, had taken place in the spirit, not in the flesh. This is confirmed by John himself. They asked him, Art thou Elias? And he answered, I'm not. He was asked, Art thou the prophet? He answered, No, I'm not. Well, there is the dilemma. Certainly, Christ was not a liar. He knew that John was not Elias in the flesh, but rather in the spirit. Therefore, it took spiritual eyes to see and accept John as Elias. Once understood symbolically, the truth was simple. Elias had returned in his spirit in John Baptist. Christ demonstrated in this example of John and Elias that the messenger of God does not return in the old flesh. It is the Holy Spirit that returns, but through another person, in another age, and with another outward day. So, what about his own return? Christ made it clear that he, as well as the one who would return in his name would be human channels for the same Holy Spirit. Of himself, he said, the work which you hear is not mine, 
but the Father which sent me. And Christ makes the same statement about the one he promises to return after he, Christ, departed. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall say, he, you, he shall hear. That shall he speak. Whatever he hears from God, he will tell you. Looking back in the his, in the recent history, there were a lot of excitements in the 1700s and the 1800s about the return of Christ, especially at the year of 1844 was approaching because all the prophecies, everybody who knew something about the Bible, they knew that they were talking about 1844. So the, as the year was coming closer, that excitement was extraordinary in, in America, in Europe, and in the East. You might be more familiar with the, with the European side of it, with the American side of it, but the same excitement was, was uh, going on in the East. <clears throat> in Europe, quarrels were many during those hectic days. Disputes as to the exact meaning of each passage of prophecy broke out frequently. Denials of the entire millennial concept were common. The battle raged in press, pamphlets, and pulpit. Each school of Bible scholars had its own ideas based on religious backgrounds and training. Now, looking back on their research, it is easy to understand from their point of view, the mighty ex that mounting excitement over their discovery, they knew they had discovered it that is 1844. <clears throat> everything was coming to that point. And everything seemed that they were right. When you look at it, you see that so many people came on prophesizing that it will happen in that in that area. You get all the, the uh, Adventist churches that has come out. They, they, they have their, base, their basic faith in, in and around 1844. Some of them even sold whatever they had in Europe and went to Israel. It wasn't Israel at the time, it was the Holy Land. It was under the Ottoman Empire uh, thing. They sold everything and they went to Mount Carmel because they, they located it also that it, is, it will be the Mount Carmel that will be the base of his return. So they went there and, and built houses and roads and everything in preparation for his coming. And they wrote on their doors that he's near. Uh, especially the German Templars. I don't know whether you've heard of them yet or uh, the, they were, it was a massive war of them, and they went there <coughs> in expectation for 1844. <coughs> so when it didn't happen as they expected it, you can see how flattened they were. It was such a disappointment for them that it didn't happen. So they, they had to come up with other formulas or other things, they would go back there and, and, and see why it didn't happen. So some of them, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they come to 1844 and they all of a sudden, they add 70 years to it. And when you say, why, why, why are you at the 70 years to that expectation? And they say, oh, for a good measure, we add 70 years to it, right? We, they said, okay, three score a year and ten. Unfortunately, it brought them to 1914, which was the start of the That's First cool. World War. <laughs> yeah. So, they, yeah. but they had worked it out. I mean, they, you, have, you have to give it to them that you know, their prophecies, if they worked it out okay, the time. 
right? Okay, <clears throat> let me go because if I don't want to take too much of your time. So I'll just skip a few, but they're all there if you're, if you're uh, really. As a result, the Adventists who had been so outspoken in their belief that Christ returned was at hand were now held, held up to ridicule. Hastily, they tried to change their calculations. They revised their mathematical formulas, searching for a possible error in what had been and uh, understood truth. Now, talking about the prophecies about the second coming and where and when, I start from Christ. Christ himself pointed to the direction from which he would, he would appear in the uh, second coming. Speaking of that day, he said, for as the lightning cometh out of the east, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We find that in Matthew. Daniel had written his words of millennial prophecy while in the east. In fact, he was in Elam, a part of ancient Persia, when he foretold with such startling accuracy the exact time of both the first and the second coming of Christ. It was in the capital city of Persia, Shushan, that Daniel had the prophetic vision that revealed the year 1844 as a time for the, for the return of the Messiah. He not only gave the 1844, but he also said that he will come from Elam, Persia. Prophet Jeremiah speaks of that same thing. Shall come to pass in the latter days, and in the verse preceding this, he says that I will set my throne in Elam, Persia. But in the latter days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam, say the Lord. Same thing, Isaiah. You can you can read that. The Micah says, I will wait for the God of my salvation in that day. Also, he shall come even to thee from Assyria which is Assyria, is the combination of Persia and Babylon. <clears throat> Almost all biblical authorities maintain that the second dec decree of Arthraxis, which I can never say it in English, his name is real Hashayash, Hashayash, but they have changed it in, <laughs> into Arthraxis. <laughs> He is he's, he's the real powerful Persian king. He signed the second decree for rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 457 BC. At the spring equinox, the first day of uh, Nisan of the Jewish calendar. And almost everybody agrees that this is the beginning for calculating the timeline of all the prophecies in the Bible. <clears throat> and calculating that, 1844 again becomes the, the first of Nisan of 1844 becomes 2,300 years of rebuilding of uh, the old temple. as the prophecies of Daniel City. He also has got another prophecy talking about 1,260 days that talks about the duration of Islam. He predicts Islam. And he says in 1,260 days, which is 1,260 years of prophetic times, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the, the Messiah will return. And I've got the base of the calculations there for you. If you want to, to work it out, it's the, how you, how you come to, how the 1,260 years 
of Islamic calendar becomes 1844 of the Christian calendar. If you, if you are to work it out, that's the, that's the formula. <clears throat> now, I talked about the new name at the beginning. Now let's see what the Bible says about the new, about the new name. Isaiah, and thou shalt be called by a new name. It was also <clears throat> clear that if the new Messiah comes with the new name, so that his followers will be called with the new name. It just, it just followed. Isaiah promises clearly that the followers of the Messiah of the last day will be very different thing. He says, the, the Lord God shall call his servants by another name. In the book of Revelation, where a new name is once again promised for the followers of Christ, of his second coming, he says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth. In words of prophecy, they promise that in the day of his return, Christ will be the holy and the true Messiah, that he will have the key, and that he will open the door to an to, an, to anyone who has ears to hear and who will not deny his new name. In the book of Revelation, it speaks not only of a new name, but of a new city, the new Jerusalem. In these words, all these things with which can, man was familiar with will change just a date changed at the time of uh, Christ's first coming. Unless a man could overcome his preconceived ideas, his prejudices, and empty his cup of former things, he would not recognize the new name and the new city. If he could set aside all the possessed and believed in, Christ promised him the following blessing. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my, of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And John, and I, John, saw the holy, holy city in New Jerusalem, and the city had no need of the sun, for the glory of God did lighten it. And in the bracket of God, there, that the New Jerusalem in the prophecy terminology means a new revelation and a new set of books suitable for the new age. <clears throat> the next question, therefore, is when would this wonder take place? When would Micah, Prince of Persia, who looked like God, appear in, and deliver the people? Daniel was told when this would take place. In the latter days, at the time of the end shall be shall be the vision. The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Shut up the words and seal the books even to the time of the end. Then in vision, Daniel sees the last days and the coming of the ancient of days. The promised one who will unseal the books. Daniel says, 
10,000 times, 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. So, so far, I think I've covered that the year 1844 will be the time for the appearance of the Messiah, that he, the one, one who looks like God, for the glory of God comes, that he would appear in the land of Persia. Now about the, the books being sealed and nobody can understand it until the Messiah comes. Daniel foretold in astonishingly accurate prophecies both the first and the second coming of Christ. He foresaw that the Messiah would be cut off, crucified in his thirties, and that this time the spirit of the Son of Man would return again in 1844. Yet no one understood the meaning of these prophecies until 1844, not even Daniel himself. You might ask why. Daniel certainly asked for the explanation and meaning of his wondrous vision. He asked God to tell him the meaning, but he received a very blunt answer. Oh, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the last of the end. <clears throat> the facts suggest that these seals mentioned by the Isaiah, who also mentioned the same thing, and Daniel, would not be opened by Christ in his first coming, but only in the second coming. It would happen. <clears throat> in the words of St. Paul, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Who will bring light to the hidden things of darkness? And the book of Revelation seems to end all questions to this subject. The basic theme of this entire book is the second coming of Christ. Revelation states plainly that those books which were sealed until the time of the end would not be unsealed and will be sealed no more after he comes. Seal not the saying of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Reverend Dean of the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, California, in his book, The Return of the Lord Jesus, listed over 250 separate passages on the certainty and consequences of the second coming of Christ. These references are more than sufficient to convince any fair-minded person that Christ had indeed left a firm promise of his coming, including the words in the final book of Christian scripture, where in the next, the last verse, it says, he which testified these things saith, surely I come quickly, even so come Lord Jesus. One of the other signs of think that the advent was so close is the prevalence of skepticism and denial of second coming. The skepticism and unbelief in prevalent concern, so prevalent concerning the second advent of Christ is it itself a sign of the last days. St. Peter tells us, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lot and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. One hears these very words everywhere, everywhere today, even among the leaders of the church. This terribly momentous event the return of Christ is regarded with incredibility as visionary. Why the epistle of James tells us, be patient therefore, brethren, 
unto the coming of the Lord. Saint Peter left the same warning about the skepticism and wrote, there shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them. And many shall follow their uh, pernicious faith, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. How much time do I have? Am I making you tired? No, that's fine. It's not boring. My wife possibly tells other words. <laughs> so I want to take you back to the story that I started at the beginning and what is happening in the East. The death of this young man occurred in July 9, 1850, in Tabriz, northwest of Persia. He was slain publicly because of his words and his teaching. Everything we learn about his life reminds us of Christ. In fact, <clears throat> after <clears throat> Carefully searching into the background, we could find that only one other event in history equals his life, and that's of the life of Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> Some remarkable similarities between the two. They were both youthful. They were both known for their meekness and loving kindness. They will both perform healing miracles. The period of their ministry was very brief in each case and moved with drastic swiftness to its climax. Both boldly challenged the time-honored conventions, laws, and rights of the religions into which they were, they were born. They courageously condemned the unbridled graft and corruption that they saw on every side, both religious and secular. The purity of their own lives shamed the people among whom they taught. Their chief enemies were among the religious leaders of the land. These officials were instigators of the outrages that they were made to suffer. They, they both had indignities heaped upon them, and a lot more similarities that they both had. Addressing his disciples, he says, Verily I say, this is the day spoken of by God in his book. Ponder the, the words of Jesus addressed to his disciples. As he sent them forth, Ye are even as the fire which in the darkness of the night has been kindled upon the mountain top. Let your light shine before the eyes of men. Such must be the purity of your, of your character and the degree of your renunciation that the people of the earth may through you recognize and be drawn closer to the heavenly Father who is the source of purity and grace. Verily I say, immensely exalted is this day about the days of the apostles of God of old. Nay, immeasurable is the difference. You are <clears throat> witnesses of the door of the promised day of God scattered throughout the length and breadth of this land and with the steadfast feet and sanctified hearts prepared the way for his coming has he not established the ascendancy of jesus poor and lowly as he was in the eyes of men arise in his name put your trust wholly in him 
and be assured of ultimate victory. This is where it gets exciting. On May 24, 1844, in the West, Samuel Morse sent this famous telegraphic message, quoting from this scripture, what God, what that, what had God wrought. On 23rd of May, 1844, the preceding day, the day before Samuel, in the East, this young man arose to make a staggering claim. So that's the day of his declaration. He declared that this was the day foretold in all the scriptures of the past. This day, he said, was the day when the promised one of all religions would appear. This was to be the day of the one fold and one shepherd. He is known as the Ba. Just as the name Christ means the anointed, the name Bob means the gate or the door. This young man claims that he is the gate or the door through which would come the one promised in all the holy books, the one who would establish the one fold of God. Now, you would remember by now the promise of Christ. But he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The Bab said that he is the hero and forerunner of one greater than himself. And his mission is to call men back to God and to prepare way for the great savior foretold by Christ and all the other prophets of the past. Just as John the Baptist had been the forerunner of Christ, the Bob claimed to be the forerunner of the promised redeemer of all ages. <clears throat> now, there are so many similarities between uh, different, different religions, and we find this, this dual uh, uh, figures in a lot of in a lot of faiths. In Zoroastrianism, we see Rishi Dharma and the Shah Bahram. In Shia Islam, the Qaim and Imam Hussein. Sunni Islam is Mahdi and Jesus Christ. In Christianity, it's John the Baptist and Christ, or Elijah and Christ. In Judaism, is Masih ben Joseph and Masih ben David. <clears throat> now, Zachariah, speaking of the last days, prophes prophesied of the twin holy souls who would appear, saying, Then said he, These are the, the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. In addition to the two woes, Revelation speaks of the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Malachi, speak, speaking of the time of the end, prophesies, Behold, I will send you Elijah, a prophet, before the coming of the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. The Bob foretold that this great Redeemer would appear exactly nine years after his own coming. He would, as prophesied in the Old Testament, suddenly come to his temple, and he would come just as Christ had so often 
emphasized in the book of Revelation. Behold, I come quickly. Bob repeatedly said that he was the door, but the promise of all ages who was soon to come after him would be the son. He foretold that this great world savior would usher in an age of unprecedented, unprecedented progress and peace. Now, here Bob talks about Baha'u'llah. The Bob said of the one yet to come, of all the tributes I have paid to him who is to come after me, the greatest is this, my written confession, that no words of mine can adequately describe him, nor can any reference to him in my book do justice to his cause. His name is Hussein Ali. Just as the name of Christ was Jesus, Jesus was known by the title of Christ in English, the anointed. Hussein Ali is known by the title of Baha'u'llah, in English, the glory of God. Baha'u'llah was born in Persia, 1817, the land in which Daniel had seen his vision of the Prince Michael, whose name means one who looks like God. When Daniel was told to seal the books until the time of the end, he also was promised. <clears throat> At that time, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which is standard for the children of thy people. We know much about Baha'u'llah and that like Christ, he had suffered great indignity and humiliation at the hands of the leaders of his day. He was brutally scourged in the prayer house in Amor. Two years after the martyrdom of the Bab, he was arrested by soldiers and marched many miles on foot to an underground prison in Tehran. He was stripped of his garment and room and was overwhelmed by abuse and ridicule. An historical account of that time record, on foot and exposed to the fierce rays of the midsummer sun, he was compelled to cover barefoot and bareheaded the whole distance between Shemiran to the dungeon. All along and route, he was pelted and vilified by the crowd. In order to silence the magic power of his tongue, and pain, Baha'u'llah was separated from his followers. He was exiled from his native land. Under armed score, he was taken over the borders of Persia into Iraq. This is funny. Perhaps you too will feel the tingling sensation that I experienced when I learned of this des destination the valley of Tigris and Euphrates River, the very spot where Ezekiel had had his vision of the glory of the Lord, Babylon. Baha'u'llah means the glory of the Lord. <clears throat> now, Micah says, for behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Baha'u'llah actually fulfilled this verse, both symbolically and actually concerning these high places. Symbolically, because he walked in the land made holy by the feet of Abraham. He was exiled to Israel, a land considered holy by the Jews Christians and Muslims. He walked with the feet of Christ, had the prophets and the prophets of old had walked. And actually, he spent many months in prayer and meditations in the mountains of Kurdistan in Iraq, 
prior to his public declaration of his mission. In the last years of his life, he walked on the side of Mount Carmel, called the Mountain of God, the nest of the prophet, and the snow white place. There, on that sacred mountain, above the cave of Elijah, Baha'u'llah wrote these words. Call out to Zion, O Carmel, and announce the joyful tidings. He that was hidden from mortal eyes is come. Next chapter of Mecca, prophecy. For, for tells this. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of me. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the flock in the midst of their fold. We already know that this prophecy begins its fulfillment in 1844, the exact year of the beginning of Baha'u'llah's faith. In 1844, the Edict of Toleration was signed, permitting the descendants of Jacob to return to Israel with freedom and security over 12, after 12 centuries of separation. That treaty was signed between the, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the British Empire in 1844. The, <clears throat> One of the conditions of that treaty was for the Jews to be able to go back to Israel. Following the arrival of Baha'u'llah in the, in the land of Israel in 1868, the Jews began to return in greater numbers to the Holy Land until in the year 1948, the state of Israel itself was formed. Now to return to Michael, it can be no doubt that he is speaking of the second coming of Christ and not of the first. For he continues his prophecy saying that it will take place in the last days. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hill and people shall flow on it. The shrine where the hero of the Baha'u'llah's faith, the Bab, is entombed on the side of Mount Carmel in Israel. Also, the world administrative center of his faith that is established on the side of this same mountain. One can be eyewitness to the crowds that flow onto it every day. You can go to that side that you would like to see those, those places. In this same chapter, Mika promises that in these last days, from this house of, house of the Lord, both the law shall go forth as well as the, as well as, as well as the word of, of the Lord. When the truth of the Messiah is known, men shall beat their swords into the plowshares. Nowadays, the seat of universal house of justice of Baha'u'llah's faith, from which the law will go forth to the national and local houses of justice in all parts of the planet, is visited by multitudes of people every day. That brings me basically to the end of my main talk, but I wanted to take the time and quickly refer to two things. One is a reference that is uh, about the false prophets that is written in the Bible. Because as soon as we, we talk about the new prophet or the new messenger, a lot of us are all false prophets. And they want to shut the door. So I thought I'll, I'll bring that in and explain it. <clears throat> You're familiar with that, with that quotation from the Bible. Here. All right. And Jesus began to say to them, take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead you astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, this must take place.
but the end is not yet. <clears throat> Anyhow, it, it goes on. But my uh, point is this. He says, many will come. So it's not one or two, it's many. Right. It could mean hundreds and even more. Each bringing about a new set in Christianity. So his prediction is spot on. <clears throat> they come in my name. They are under the shadow of Christ's name and identity. They have the cross and the Bible as the reference. And they will lead many astray. Millions of Christ followers will listen and follow them. Now, the point is that none of the above applies to Baha'u'llah in his faith. Baha'u'llah has not come in the name of Christ. Although he confirms the station of Christ, nor is he showing the cross as the symbol of his church. Ahala is announcing a new mighty revelation of God as never seen by mankind. He has revealed new books and wrote for now and in the future of mankind for centuries to come. I brought some of those for you. You can go through them. Christ follows his remarks by saying, you shall know them by their fruits. Baha'u'llah's revelation and teachings are centered upon justice and love. It's being designed to bring peace and prosperity on earth, to fulfill Christ's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I would like to finish it by another uh, prophecy from the mighty Isaiah. Beautifully describes the second coming of Christ. A lot of people make a mistake of saying that this is a prophecy about the first coming, but it's not. The text it will tell you when you read it. For us, for unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace thank you very much thank you sorry if i have to say <laughs> Says time for a few questions. If, if there's any or comments anybody wants to make, I'll open it up also to anybody online. I just want to sure we can, yeah, I should be able to hear you. Um, okay, if anyone's got any questions for for Assan, do you mind if I go and sit there that's and fine. answer the questions yeah. while we're we sitting? Bring out, no, that's right. I'll turn the chair. Turn the chair. So there you go, you can be, we can all be seen now. Yeah, can you all be seen? Okay, great, uh, great, great. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments they want, want to put? There was a lot to cover. Yeah, it works really well. Um, much that Bahula, did he write down his prophecies and his teachings himself, or did he? use a scribe or? Yeah, in many places, that's a very good question actually. In many places, he wrote it himself. So his handwritings are all preserved, they're all kept. Uh, and in a lot of other places, he had scribes, three scribes. Mm -hmm. He had three scribes at, at, one, at one time. Because once he was getting this, 
mighty revelation. The, uh, it was coming like a flood right, to him. Mm. And he would say things. All right. And scribes would write it down. Each one would write it so that they could check with each other, which is if they had left anything up. Mm. And then at the end, we'll take it to Baha'u'llah and say, this is what we have written. Check it, please. And he would check it. And he would correct it if they have missed anything. Because the speed of it was so much, it was so hard. So he would check it and they said, no, this, is, this is the way that it was. So they all authenticated by himself. And on each page, he would put his seal. Right. Right. So he would stamp it. His, his own step so that nothing can be added to it or can be taken away so everything is authentic and they all kept now in a museum when you go to when you go to Haifa in Israel there's a particular beautiful place built for his writings and for his belongings whatever he had and are they in a number of sort of different sections or books yes Yes. Each with a sort of different yes. uh, it, domain. It, it, it's, uh, topic. Uh, that's right. A lot of his writings are talking about peace and tranquility, how to bring peace about to the world. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, he writes to several of queens and kings of his time. Napoleon, the uh, queen, uh, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Tsar of the Rus, the German, mm -hmm. uh, like the, the, to the Pope, uh, to all the influential people who were at the time, the Ottoman Empire, Khalid, uh, and also to the Persian king that caused him so much mm -hmm. uh, pain and so mm -hmm. and so, so they, they are all written about the, how to bring peace. He said, I don't want anything of this world, personal. But what I want is the uh, prosperity for all. It's, he calls it prosperity for all. Uh, yeah, so yes, there are some uh, <clears throat> personal conducts that he recommends, right? How to conduct your life on the, and on the individual level, at the daily level prayers for daily living. And also he has got all these uh, teachings for how to bring peace and security. And that. Yeah. Mm. And they are all there. Mm. And the, most of them are uh, translated into English. Majority of his writings are into English, French, all, all major, all major languages. Mm. Yeah. He's buried there as well. Sorry, he's buried there. He's buried in uh, in Akka, yeah. which is about forty kilometers away from Haifa. Right. Akka was where he was actually exiled to. It's a fortress city, right, in Israel. That the uh, at the time of the war between Muslims and Christians, this fortress was built around the. Right. Uh, different mm -hmm. places to to stop the uh, Muslims to come in, mm -hmm. right? Okay. I would say very impressive buildings, mm -hmm. very dark buildings, uh, in as much as they're, they're so big and so in you know intimate. Now, what's the word? Uh, Frightens, intimidate, intimidate, yeah. intimidate. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. The, the look of them. Mm. All right, mm. and they are, the walls are so so wide and made out of stone. They are so tough. Uh, uh, Napoleon tried to go and conquer. Well, right. uh, and he he couldn't. Mm -hmm. He couldn't, mm -hmm. and he left his uh, he left his. Uh, Equipments and things buried inside the inside the caves around the uh, 
around the fortress as a sign of that he did there and not not being able to conquer it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Baha'u'llah was sent to that jail. The Ottoman Empire used it, used that building as a uh, as a place of sending his their unwanted people. Right. They, they almost at the same time Brits would send their unwanted people to Australia or places like Australia. Ottoman Empire would send the people to Akka to that prison mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Because if whoever went there, the weather was so bad. Uh, it was so wide and water was horrible. And who, who would get there? Nobody gets out in, in, uh, in standing up. <laughs> yeah, the condition was, was terrible. So uh, on the night that they arrived there, of course, they all under, uh, under uh, escort and everything else. Uh, on, on the night that they arrived there, three of his beside people who were accompanying him died on that first night. Mm -hmm. It was awful. Mm. The conditions was awful. Mm. And he endured that for, for many years. Mm. It, uh, but it was the time that gave him the chance to write. Yeah. write and, and, uh, it, and distribute his writings. Because the Ottomans wouldn't let him mm. contact his, his followers. Yeah. Right. The followers would come to the gate of the city and stand with the hope of seeing his hands from the window. There would come mm. thousands of miles mm. on foot mm. to be able to see him. Mm. Uh, and they were happy just to see his hands and they would go back. The astonishing time, the history of the faith is amazing. Uh, it's amazing to read. To read. Yeah. Thank you very much. For You're welcome. Thank coming. you. And thanks for the opportunity. Did you have a question? Yes, I did have a question. But yeah. I thought, God, it's, it's too, too long to lay it out. But this timeline so the bar is the it's the forerunner to Baha, Baha Yes, sir. Now, Baha preaches or is born in 1844? Baha Baha started in 1844. Right. And Baha came nine years later. Right. So 1952 53 is when Baha got his mission. And you went some number of thousands back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, and then you went to Daniel. Now, what is the position of the Prophet Muhammad in Baha'i faith? Is he like the second coming of Jesus, and then then becomes third coming of Baha'u'llah? Is third coming or so? A very good, very good question. That that's a very good question. I didn't I want to just you know prolong the evening. One of the one of the principles that Baha'u'llah and the Bab were establishing was this fact that there is only one God. There are not two gods. There's only one mighty God, the creator. And that requires that all the messengers of him are one. He doesn't have 10 messages for, or, or more. He's got only one message and he's sending it down. And that message gets updated every time that it that mankind has moved on okay so and he calls this principle a progressive revelation 
is one revelation from Adam until now is really one revelation. But because mankind progresses in understanding in spirituality, mankind is progressing, so therefore his revelation has to progress with mankind. It's the same message. None of those messages are, are contradicting each other. Sure. There has not been one messenger coming to say that the other messenger was wrong, first of all, and or to say that, for example, lying is good. They all said, be truthful. They all said, be, be righteous. They all said, help other people. So the differences between the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago and Prophet Muhammad about 1,200 years ago, 1,400 years ago, is only because mankind has moved up. Mankind has progressed. It's the, same the message. it's the same message. But not the second coming. The second coming happens just the once in the 1844 from so the Jesus so Christ first coming is the I, I have to I have to say this that and I think I mentioned that in my talk there that the 1260 years of Islam it is right on the 1844 right and both prophecies of 1260 years and 2300 years are verging on the same year in the Christian era of 1844. So Islam and Christianity, when it comes to prophecies, they are identical. The, for, for, for example, two different ways from Daniel. No, Daniel gives two different dates. Yeah. Right. One gives the beginning of Islam. Right, and it gives Islam 1260 days. So it puts the correct date for the Islam, right? And it uh, so if you go truly and you read it properly, every Christian, every every Jew should have accepted Muhammad as the true prophet of God. But they all missed it. They all miss the beauty of of Muhammad. Okay, because Daniel is saying it, Isaiah is saying it, the revelation, the new revelation is saying it. The same date is 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 common between the the two books, right? The dates are common, but people missed it because they were expecting something miraculously to come out of the clouds right the son of man will be wrapped in clouds they didn't understand what does it mean that he, he is wrapped in, in clouds the clouds were our own obsessions our own prejudices not that he will be wrapped in, with, with our preconceived ideas became the cloud that covered the beauty of man Okay, and the Prophet Muhammad would go hard on the Jews and the and the Christians of his time. He would really go hard. He would ask him, "It's written in your books. Why don't you accept it?" All right. Mm -hmm. the, it's, it's the historical mm -hmm. thing that he, he was he was uh, amused why people do, uh, who professing to be Christians and and Jews are not accepting him. You see, the prophecies were there, but people were missing it. Right? Another quick question that though we get from about 600 years after Jesus to, to Muhammad, but there's another famous Persian prophet you missed, Mani. Is there anything for Mani in the Baha'i faith? I haven't come across, I haven't come across Mani. I know that in the, in the Persian uh, historical books you read of him, but 
it is not a lot to go by because the kings of Persia they didn't like his philosophy, right? And they they finished it really well and truly. But basically, all the uh, all the written records were were wiped out, and there is very little that I know of him. That's all I can say about them. Yeah. I just I just mentioned Leo's question before. Uh, what references in the Bible point to the year 1844 as being of any significance? Okay. So you're talking about yes. Daniel, I think. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, the... Maybe you'll go back to the page and put it up there. So that... <coughs> because the calculation I think you wrote. Yes, you wrote it somewhere here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Where's my yeah. So that's Daniel says that, and also the uh, the book of Revelation gives the exact identical. Daniel eight two. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I think it's Revelation eleven. I think. Oh, yeah. that, that also uh, yeah. Revelation yeah. talks about. The same thing, identical things, and they both mention the two thousand three hundred years. Yeah. And they both mention yeah. one thousand three hundred and sixty days. Now, when you add, because that dec uh, decree of uh, that king of Persia, which I can't say the name. It's fine. I can't <laughs> say art, 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 uh, I can't say the uh, okay. of 457 BC mm -hmm. to 1844 becomes 2300 years, and that's what Daniel says, and that's what the, the new uh, revelation says. Mm -hmm. can they I both, take a photo of that, of course, you can. Yes, yes, there are copies. There are copies. Yes, copies. Yeah. And if you want more, I can I can always copy it. Oh, and you could also I, well I've got it on my computer now. Yeah, so so you can email it as well. Yeah, yeah. So four hundred and fifty-seven to eighteen forty-four becomes two thousand. And three hundred years, and that's where he ca he calculates his things from that de that decree of uh, of Hashayasha. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a much nicer sounding name in Persian. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it it means the gift of God actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that uh, that very fair king. He, 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 he was, was very good. I'm not sure how fair they could have been in that time because. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, the things is the uh, history says that he was a fair king. So. Mm -hmm. it, 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 Iranian history says that. I'm sure where he went, like conquered, possibly they, mm -hmm. they would have said it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do these gaps hold also for like Zoroaster and so on as you go? Is it the same gap or is it different gaps? No, I don't think it's the same gap. The, it's roughly about a thousand years that every, every thousand year God has renewed it, but it's not exact. Say, for example, it's 1,260 days for Islam, right? That duration of Islam is given in, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Uh, but it was only 622 years for, for Christ. Uh, and then Muhammad came. Mm -hmm. the, so how, how is it worked? I suppose my understanding is that the people of, of uh, that part of the world in, in Arabia, they were so needed, they so much in so much in need of, of guidance. Right? That's why Muhammad came 
to them that the spirit appeared amongst them, right? And look what happened as a result of it. It took only 60 years after Muhammad, before they, they conquered basically the, the known world of the Jews. They conquered Rome, they conquered mm. Persia, they conquered Egypt, they conquered mm. Rome. Mean, mm. It only took 60 years after that. It just been possibly they, they were in need of some guidance to give them a bit of mm -hmm. yes. momentous. Not that I, I agree the way that they conquered, because I think that they conquered it in, in a very wrong way. But they could have conquered the whole world more peacefully than the way that they did. Mm -hmm. But that's history. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think it's yeah. approaching nine o'clock, so we shouldn't have to yes. draw a line on this tonight. All right. But, Hey, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Very much. And look, thank we'd you. just like to present you with a, ah, a small gift. Oh, beautiful. Some more beautiful. reading for you. That's beautiful. <laughs> but um, you may find you. that you know, some of the um, ah. issues and sure. topics sure. in that book are, thank you. Which are all related, of course, to of our course. Of course. faith. And of course. Of course. Thank you. Quite in, you know, some commonalities, although from probably from different perspectives. Correct. Thank you, Correct. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, David, for giving me the chance. Oh, okay. It was lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you. that we can have you guys back in our, our, our list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you for the contact. Oh, that would be great. Thank mm. you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, everybody online as well. Um, thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. And uh, we'll look oh, just before you disappear, I will mention next time we meet in a month's time, we have um, Reverend Todd Beiswanger from Sydney, who's going to be joining us via Zoom. I can't tell you what his topic is, but um, he'll be he'll be with us next month. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.